Welcome to the Israel Bible Podcast. My name is Cindy Parker, and I am an author, a speaker, and the professor of Holy Land Studies at Israel Bible Center. I am passionate about reading the Bible in the physical, historical, and cultural context of its day. And I really love having geeky conversations with people about new things. In this podcast, I'd like to invite you to join me as I sit down each week with other faculty members of IBC to discover and talk about new aspects of the Bible. These are some of my favorite dialogues because as a modern audience reading an ancient text, we know that the Bible does not need to be rewritten, but it needs to be reread. This week, I talk with Dr. Nicholas Shazer about his course, All Israel Will Be Saved. And this course is not for the faint of heart. It is based on Romans 9 through 11 and seems to have so many layers of complex ideas that you cannot simply give these ideas a cursory reading. So Dr. Shazer takes his students layer by layer by layer through Paul's theology, and you'll hear ideas that are very likely something that are new to you. I was so pleased when Dr. Shazer and I found time to talk about his course and was quite impressed that he got up super early and was still able to have clear thoughts about this complex writing. Before we got together to record, I reread Romans 9 through 11, actually, which is something you may want to do as well. I kept thinking, this passage is so dense. Every sentence in Romans, much less 9 through 11, makes reference to something in the Hebrew Bible, and sometimes the references are not plainly obvious. So I think it is good to have someone to walk with us through some of Paul's thoughts. I think you'll want to hear more and dig into the details. And in that case, you can find Dr. Shazer's course, All Israel Will Be Saved, under the course heading at israelbiblecenter.com. And while you're there, just sign up as a student and start earning credits towards Israel Bible Center Certificate Program in Jewish Context and Culture. It is super easy. Okay, now grab some coffee and let's dig into the book of Romans. It's one of my it's one of my favorite pieces of writing in the New Testament, Romans. And Romans has had a long storied history. Of, um, essentially, it, it it creates religious movements. It's that powerful of a text. Augustine discovered Romans and started an interpretational revolution that's still being felt, you know, in the church <laughs> today. Or you know, um, Luther. You know, Romans was massive for Luther. My doctoral advisor said, if you ever want to start a new Christian denomination, just Put your close your eyes, open your Bible, put your finger somewhere in Romans, and it's a good place to start. <laughs> it's such an important theological text for Christianity in general, and we oftentimes think of Paul as like, you know, sitting in some sort of ivory tower with a halo around his head, and you know, Handel's Messiah playing in the background or something. <laughs> but that's just not not the case. I mean, Paul, if Paul's you know dictating the material to somebody else, and they're writing it down. And so think of like somebody who's kind of pacing back and forth and just off the top of his head throwing these Hebrew Bible texts out. And usually Paul's trying to deal with a problem. And there are some problems in, in that he perceives in Rome as well, even though he's never been there before. Um, and that's actually one of the problems, is he's trying to introduce himself to a community that he, he's never been to. He wants to get there, but he hasn't been there yet. But normally Paul, like in Galatians, for example, or 1 Corinthians, for sure, is doing damage control. Um, there's a problem or multiple problems. And so just be thinking of, yeah, this first century Jewish guy, this Pharisee, pacing back and forth, kind of hot, kind of upset <laughs> often, and and just you know off the top of his head just throwing this material at a at a writer and that really puts it into historical context and makes what paul is up to in a in a text like romans which cindy as you said is so dense and so finely woven and and it is indeed so theological but but paul's not a pastor paul is not a, in the classical christian sense paul is just coming up with this off the top of his head which is actually why i've become more and more convinced that i think he has all of the Tanakh, all of Israel's scriptures, essentially committed to memory. So let that sink in for a bit. It's pretty amazing. 
I was thinking that too, because um, I was looking at some of the references that he makes in specifically chapters nine through 11. And they are, some of them are weird. Like it's like the introductory phrase. And I'm like, oh gosh, the the depth of what he knows and has committed to memory that he can pull this up off the top of his head, like you were saying, is astounding. Yeah, I, I I still don't understand it, but it's uh yeah, he's he's pretty amazing, which is which makes it so much fun reading Paul, but also it, it makes it confusing and it's really really hard work, particularly for for, you know, we moderns. <laughs> it's <Right>. difficult. <laughs> Dr. Shazer mentioned the Roman church or the Roman audience that Paul is addressing. So before we get to the particular theology, I think we should talk about the context of the church in Rome. We have to start with the politics because they're changing everything. Okay, so as a quick review, Tiberius was the emperor during the time Jesus was a child living in Nazareth. The Jewish population in Rome was growing, and they started having a sizable impact on the citizens in Rome, which some Roman leaders saw as undermining the government. So the Roman Empire was flourishing, but there were also religious frictions that began to develop. Christianity also developed during the last years of Tiberius's life and in attempts to quell some of the religious friction that was going on in the empire, Tiberius tried to legalize Christianity, an idea that the Senate did not support. So Caligula was next. He had a super complex, dramatic, and cruel life that could be a really fun episode all in itself. But he was killed by his own guards, who then appointed Claudius as ruler. So Claudius is who we need to really focus on. The religious friction persisted in Rome in particular, and Claudius saw the Jews as the troublemakers who undermined his own right to rule, and he expelled them from Rome. Gentile Christians, however, were not expelled from Rome. And so here's where we get some of the drama because it drove a wedge between the Gentile and the Jewish believers. As an interesting aside, it is Claudius's edict to remove the Jews from Rome that forced Priscilla and Aquila to go to Corinth, where they eventually meet Paul and then go with him to Ephesus before they return to Rome. But I digress. Given this complex history, by the time this letter gets to Rome, who is the intended audience? The Gentile Christians or the Jewish Christians or both? What's going on? Who's reading the letter? That is a wonderful question. And I, I'm not sure that we can quite get to the bottom of it uh, completely. But um, what we know about Paul in general is that he is the apostle to the Gentiles. He uses this phrase of himself all the time. It shows up, I think, in almost every Pauline epistle. And, and Romans is no different. At the end of Romans, he says, you know, I'm doing all this work as kind of priestly worship for God, and I'm offering the Gentiles as the priests would, would offer an offering, and I'm hoping that my offering of Gentiles will be pleasing to the, to the Spirit. So uh, and, and right at the very beginning, he says, you know, I, I'm, I've got a message, I've got a gospel, I've got good news for the Gentiles. So while the Roman church or Roman assembly of Jesus followers almost certainly had Jews in it, along with Gentiles, it seems that Paul's primary message is for the Gentiles in this assembly. Indeed, later on in Romans chapter 11, he's going to kind of do a little sidebar and say, now I'm speaking to you Gentiles insofar as I am the apostle to the Gentiles. So we know that um, you know Paul addresses Jews, Paul ad addresses Jewish practice, uh, Jewish scripture, and talks about Jewish people in Romans. But it's almost certain that the primary audience that Paul has in mind here is, is the Gentiles within this group of Jesus believers. Which makes me think they're going to have to pull in their Jewish brothers and sisters <laughs> to unravel all the references he's making. Because if that's not their immediate, natural, instinctive context, they're going to need help figuring out what it is that Paul is saying, which is kind of what you do in your course. I love it. It's like 
you you put up a slide and then it's like here's all the references to the Tanakh that Paul mm-hmm. makes in this one <laughs> phrase which is yeah. Amazing. And we're going to have to see how much of that we can unpack without having the visuals of your class. That's right. Yep. Yep. Could be tricky, but it it also should be fun. Yeah. (laughs) All right. Well, let's start with a really big idea that is why would Paul not be interested in Gentiles doing this phrase that he uses, the work of the law? So even what is that phrase? Is he making reference to all of the commands in the Tanakh or or is it something else? So there's the work of the law that he brings up and then he seems to say that the Gentiles don't have to do this, which seems counterintuitive. That's right. Yep. So yeah, very big question. And uh, also it, it's going to take about 30 seconds for listeners to realize how complicated this is. So works of the law, Paul likes to use this phrase. And uh, in Greek, that's ergon to nomu. And the problem is, is that it doesn't, that phrase hardly ever shows up or anything similar to that shows up in contemporary Jewish literature of the first century. So interpreters are kind of out at sea when it comes to Paul's use of works of the law. Does it mean the entire law or does it mean specific works, specific deeds therein? More and more scholars are saying that when Paul uses works of the law, and I would agree with this, that Paul is thinking of very specific things. There are very few contemporary references to that phrase, works of the law, in the literature that surrounds the Pauline corpus. But but what we can know about this is that there are certain commands in the Torah that Paul wants Gentiles not to do, to avoid. And at the same time, there are commands from the Torah that Paul wants Gentiles to observe. So, for example, one that he does not want Gentiles to observe, this is probably the most important one, and any reader of the Pauline corpus will be able to see this quickly, is that Paul doesn't want Gentiles being circumcised. Circumcision is a command in the Torah, it appears in Genesis 17, 11, and Leviticus 12, 3, among other places. So it is a work of the law. It's a, it's a deed of the Torah. Paul absolutely does not want Gentiles being circumcised. So we know that Paul doesn't want Gentiles doing some of these works, but other works he's quite happy to have them do. For example, at the end of Galatians, he says, you know, um, you should love your neighbor as yourself because the entire Torah is summed up in that command. Well, that command comes from Leviticus 19.18. That's the heart of the Torah. It's literally smack dab in the middle of the Torah. There's another really interesting one, and this is among many, many. Um, Paul is constantly using Torah dictates and saying Gentiles should be following these. But one really fun one is uh, fun. <laughs> That, that's a that's a Bible uh, reader saying <laughs> fun. Comes from yeah, exactly. It comes from First Corinthians chapter five, which is uh, a text about sexual immorality in the Corinthian church. Paul is addressing the fact that one of the parishioners, one of the people in the in the assembly, is um, is sleeping with his father's wife. So not so fun. The, the actual problem is not fun. But what's really interesting about First Corinthians chapter five is Paul says, okay, what do we do with this guy? And at the end of the very short chapter, this is 5.13, if someone wants to look it up, Paul says, okay, with this person, kick him out, all right? Throw him out of the assembly, at least temporarily, so that his flesh will be destroyed and his spirit will be saved. Okay, well, exactly what Paul means there is unclear, but it's, it's telling what he says in the last line of the chapter. He says, when you kick this person out, thus you shall purge the evil from among you. Okay. Cindy, where, where does that come from? Uh, that sounds just like Deuteronomy. <laughs> yeah, that's right. You got it. So, thus you shall purge the evil from among you. Uh, that phrase or something like it, I think Cindy shows up like nine times in Deuteronomy. And half the time it says, thus you shall purge the evil from among you or from your midst. And then the other half of the time it says, you shall purge the evil from Israel. So there are various reasons why you would do this. Um, so if someone uh, is an idolater, for example, you take that person and you purge that person from among you. If the person um, commits sexual immorality, like in Deuteronomy 22, the, that's, that's reason enough to 
to purge that person from among you. Now, in Deuteronomy, it usually means stoning that person to death. Paul actually reads this hyper-literally to the Corinthians and says, kick them out, purge them, boot them out, which actually is not Paul's innovation. Josephus, the first century Jewish historian, does something similar to this, and there are other Jewish interpretations of the time that's taking that not as kill the person, because there's not a ton of uh, first century um, archeological evidence that Jewish people were stoning each other, you know, but what they were doing is kind of, to use a, a Christian term, excommunicating them, kicking them out. Which for a modern audience, I don't think we realize how significant that is because for people living at that time in that place, community was everything, honor, shame, belonging to community. So if you're being kicked out, it is a type of its own death. Good. That's right. right. Uh, that's yeah. right. It's, it, this is often why the text will talk about being a uh, karat, cut off from among your people. Well, karat can either mean kicked out or killed, uh, depending on the context. So definitely, it would have been a big deal. Uh, the interesting with Paul is he's speaking to a bunch of Gentiles whom he does not want getting circumcised. So there are certain works of the law that he does not want them doing. And yet he he says to kick this guy out of the assembly and cites Deuteronomy. So that is, Paul wants them to do that. And so the question you have to ask is, well, what's Paul's rubric for what Gentiles should get up to and what Gentiles shouldn't get up to? Oftentimes, uh, in in modern Christianity, the, the bifurcation goes like this, something like, well, Gentile Christians should do the moral commands of the Torah, but shouldn't do the ritual commands of the Torah. So that is, they're taking circumcision as a ritual and something like love your neighbor as yourself as moral. Well, if we go back to that 1 Corinthians chapter 5, purge the evil from among you, it's interesting because that is a ritual act in Deuteronomy. Uh, the, the, the Hebrew of Deuteronomy is ba'ar. It literally means to burn, burn out or purge out uh, the person from among you. Well, that is used in certain ritual contexts. Like, for example, Leviticus chapter 6, the burning of the wood on the altar by the priest, same word, ba'ar, okay? So that is, you get the community together in Deuteronomy, and you ritually identify the idolater or the, the sexually immoral person, and you ritually purge them from Israel. So that is, that is a ritual command. The point is, it's very difficult to bifurcate, to make a a clear distinction between what is moral and what is ritual. The classical ritual texts that come from Leviticus 1 through 7, the sacrifices on the altar, every Christian would say that's a ritual thing that the Gentiles don't need to do. Well, is it ritual? The whole point of it is to purge sin. That's a moral problem. And so, so that classical difference between moral and ritual commands absolutely doesn't work. So we've got to look elsewhere. And, and this is where I would look and where many others uh, today, many other Paulian scholars today would also look. We would talk about certain Torah commands that were Jewish identity markers. So circumcision is a Jewish identity marker. What do I mean by a Jewish identity marker? I mean a sign between God and the people of Israel that would mark out a person as Jewish, as a member of Israel, as opposed to a member of the other nations. Now we can see how circumcision would do this. It's a visual marker so that the person who's circumcised can know, can see themselves, their own body, a mark on their own body, to show their Jewishness or their Israelness. And others would be able to see this too. You'd wonder in which context they'd be able to see that. But in the ancient world, there were gymnasiums, um, in, in, essentially where, where Greco-Roman people would congregate not only to exercise, but also to, to kibitz, to, uh, to talk, to go through you know, the week. It was, a, it was a social gathering point. And the thing is, is the men in these gymnasiums were in the nude. That was part of the tradition. So if a Jewish person wanted to participate in that, everyone knew that the, a Jewish man was a Jewish man because he was naked and you could see the marks of his circumcision. So that's one example of, a, of an outward, external Jewish identity marker. Whereas purge the evil person from you, anybody can do that, whether they're Jewish or Gentile, and it doesn't affect their outward appearance, either to themselves or to others. And if I just, just to back up to underscore this, um, the first time we get this word sign, in Hebrew, ot is a sign. And circumcision in, in Genesis 17, 11, is also a sign. God says, I'm going to make a sign between me, the God of Israel, and you, Abraham, and ultimately the people of Israel. 
So the first time that we see a sign in the Bible comes in Genesis chapter 4, after Cain kills Abel. And Cain says, my punishment is too great to bear. I don't know how I'm going to do this. And you know what? If you expel me, anybody who finds me is going to kill me. So God puts an ot, a sign, onto Cain. We don't know what it is, but we know it's an outward mark of some kind because God says, this sign is going to show people that it's you and they won't kill you. So that is, a sign has outward, external, identity-changing power. And so circumcision is the same way. What are some other signs in, in the Hebrew Bible? In Exodus uh, thirty-one thirteen, the Sabbath is a sign between God and Israel. And in the ancient world, Greco-Romans didn't follow the Sabbath. So anybody resting or not working, not coming to work on Saturday, for example, that's an outward identity marker. I, I hope this makes sense. That is, non-Jews would be able to identify a Jew in the ancient world through these signs, through these identity markers. One more from Deuteronomy chapter 6. The, this is the classic, you shall bind the commandments uh, betwixt your eyes and uh, on your heart. Well, later on in the time of Jesus, these became what's known as, as tefillin, or in English, it's, this is the Greek, um, phylacteries. And the interpretation was to take bits of Torah, uh, little small scrolls, and put them in these boxes that you affix between your eyes on your head and that you wrap on your arm so you can put it near your heart. So that is, it became a Jewish mode of dress that Jewish people today, practicing Jews today, still do, usually in the mornings as a part of prayer. But in the ancient world, it was worn more frequently. You can actually hear Jesus chastising the Pharisees about this in Matthew chapter 23. They make their tefillin, their phylacteries, too broad on their heads so that other people can see them and think that they're so righteous. So again, these are outward identity markers that people can see. So that is a long-winded way of saying, but I think it's important to underscore it from all sorts of different texts to prove the point, is that the bifurcation we should be making is probably not between moral and ritual, which doesn't make a lot of sense in the biblical context, but rather between outward Jewish identity markers and everything else. So I, when Paul uses works of the law, it seems to me most likely that he is referring to these Jewish identity markers that Gentiles should avoid. Be sure to join us next week when we continue to talk about Romans 9 through 11. And I ask a question that stems from the conversation you just heard. Why does Paul want Gentiles to remain Gentiles and not take on Jewish identity markers? Zechariah 8.23, in that day, at the end of days, says Zechariah, 10 men from the nations will grab onto the robe of one Jew and say, bring us to uh, worship of your God because we've heard that God is with you. So that is, even in the end of days, on Paul's reading, Gentiles stay Gentiles and Jews stay Jews. Every time a Gentile male gets circumcised, that person turns into Israel, is, is made Jewish, enters into the children of Israel. So if that happens often enough, then there's no more nations of the world everyone becomes Israel. And if everyone becomes Israel, then there are no other nations left for Israel to bless. That is, every time a Gentile is circumcised, it begins to unravel God's promise to Abram in Paul's eyes. And we go all the way back to Genesis to see how this works out. A quick announcement. New episodes of the Israel Bible podcast are now available on Wednesday mornings, Eastern Standard Time. It's a good reason to like or follow this podcast on Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, or Spotify. It's still free, as always, but you automatically get the download, and you don't have to worry about missing out or remembering which day it comes out. It just automatically shows up. If you cannot wait to hear more, you can always enroll in Dr. Shazer's course, All Israel Will Be Saved. There's a link to the course along with other helpful notes in the show notes of this episode. Thank you, Jeremy McDonald from Mason Jar Music for doing such an amazing job mixing, editing, and crafting all the good sounds you hear. And thank you for hanging out with me and being curious about all things Bible-related. <laughs>